come at me with your scientific terms. Because most people wonder, how did I actually get H. pylori? That's the reason that the stomach has stomach acid. But I'm not pro-poo hands. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about H. pylori. This is one of my favourite topics at the moment. And it's something that's been coming about, like talked about significantly. Like I've seen in my personal experience, it's probably been talked a lot about in other industries, but I've been doing a lot more kind of deep dive into this. And anyone who's joining today, thank you so much for joining us again. We really appreciate your support and everything that you guys are doing. We've had some really good feedback from people. We've had some really good questions come back and it's been actually really, really lovely to see a lot of support coming in from different people, kind of sharing their own personal stories. Um, This, today talking about H. pylori is going to be a bit of a strange one because it kind of like branches off into so much because we're going to cover things like antibiotic resistance and looking at like the food chain and what uh, I'm kind of scared to go into this topic today because I actually do think that this potentially could get us cancelled. I'm not even going to lie. I think you're thinking too big about it. Uh, I'm do, but do you know why I'm thinking too what why I'm thinking too big about it because when I when I was saying to you, let's do this topic right, yeah. and we started talking about it, I started doing my research around it, and I started looking at like other people, what they were saying about H. pylori, and jeez, the shit that's out there, the absolute crap that's out there has actually, it, it actually made me feel a bit like people don't understand what H. pylori actually is and how it functions in the physical system. And you're a nutritionist, Really? You've done, <laughs> you've done clinical practice. You've seen H. pylori, mm-hmm. it's but very common. But it's very common with loads of people. But what many of us don't understand is that even though they say fifty percent of the world population actually has it, it's only a small minority, around about fifteen to seventeen percent, that yeah. actually have yeah. the have the strains of it. But what's happening recently that I noticed, and this is this is my experience, is I found a lot of people were trying to treat H. pylori when it wasn't H. pylori that was the problem because they the person had tested positive for it, but they weren't looking at the symptoms. You've made a really good point there, actually, because I think. H. pylori, for whatever reason, um, has become a topic that's much more uh, discussed by the everyday person um, in the last several years. And I think because it's a topic that's so popular, it's become that thing that when someone feels a certain symptom you know, around their gut, their head immediately thinks, oh, maybe it's H. pylori. Um, And I think sometimes we can attach on to that and, you know, not look at some of the simpler cues or the simpler explanations and things like that. And you're, you're so right. I think in particular, a lot of people might have simple reflux or, um, you know, just like slight digestive issues and can think of that as H. pylori is quite a common one that I've experienced. Um, But it's also quite complicated because, as you say, a lot of people have um, H. pylori just kind of sitting there that isn't symptomatic. Um, And but obviously, if you're testing, then it comes up positive. And if it comes up positive, then it's very difficult not to go down that journey of, well, let me look at treating it because we don't really want to do the simpler things, do we? Well, of um, course not. I mean, that's the the weird thing about it. So when I was looking at H. pylori, the research mm-hmm. of it, the first kind of place point of call to start was how did I actually get it? Because most people wonder, how did I actually get H. pylori? Well, I think before you go there, can you explain just what H. pylori is for anyone that isn't familiar? So it's called a gram-negative bacteria, and it's got like a rod-like structure to it. And it's got these things called... Come at me with your scientific terms. That reminds me of reading the papers, like gram-negative (laughs) rod-like structure. It's all to do with that structure of of the actual bacteria. And and basically, because it has a helix, like the flagella of it, it can swim. So it can literally use its flagella to, to swirl. That's what allows it to swim through the actual stomach acid. The interesting thing with H. pylori is it's known as a urease enzyme excreting bacteria. Mm-hmm. What that means is you have your urea, so uric acid, which is normally pissed out 
Sorry. It's normally pissed out. There you go. Can you not say something? I know. Can you not say like urinated out or removed through the urine? Okay. It's normally pissed out. (laughs) Normally we pass it out through through urine. And what H. pylori does, when it excretes that enzyme, that enzyme divides it it into carbon dioxide and into ammonia. Mm -hmm. And ammonia is what it actually uses to change the pH in the stomach. And so... What's interesting is that the H. pylori, it also releases histamine. So it's actually known as a histamine excreting bacteria because of something called lipopolysaccharides or LPS. Um, You'll probably hear your clinician talk a lot about LPS quite a lot. And what LPS is, is LPS is what allows the H. pylori to attach itself to the epithelial cells in the stomach. And I'm just going to start by saying... When we talk about the digestive tract, everyone's instant everyone's instant focus always goes to the intestines and the colon. Mm. And it's, honestly, it's the most frustrating thing that it really gets on my nerves. Look, I've said it before. I'm not a clinician, right? Not trying to be a clinician. Never have been. Don't want to be for many, many reasons around it. All right. Calm not, in a, <laughs> not in a bad way. It's just no, no. I've seen what happens when you become a yeah, clinician yeah, and talk yeah. about certain topics, right? It, it scares me a little bit. But what really annoys me is that whenever you talk about the gut, people always have like the picture of like the love hearts on their intestines or something. Or they talk about that. L- listen, your gut starts in your mouth. Mm-hmm. This is where your everything starts in the mouth. And then it goes into the stomach. Your stomach is your point first point of call of your digestive tract. Mm-hmm. And you have the exact same epithelial cells in the stomach as you have in your intestines and in your colon. So Mm -hmm. that's the start of it. So looking after this bit and looking after this bit is just as important as looking after the intestines. But also I think, you know, you're... If not more so. Yeah. Well, I think the big thing about the stomach that we don't consider as much, it's the major barrier between the external and the internal world of your digestive system, of your gut. And that's a really important task that it holds. That's the reason that the stomach has stomach acid because that's the main barrier um, that's kind of preventing pathogens and bacteria and nasties and anything getting through into the internal world where they could cause even more damage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we really need to think about that acid layer as a positive and an important thing and something that needs to maintain its integrity. Um, so you're so right in what you're saying. Amazing. As opposed to a nuisance. Yeah. <laughs> so what? So this is the thing with H. pylori. When it's in the stomach, even if you have it, it can lie dormant Mm. and we still can't understand why it becomes virulent and why it actually starts to attack. Now, there is an interesting study. I'm going to link it in the description uh, done in Brazil. It was only done on a small population size of about 52 people. And what they found was that people who consumed higher like grains, carbohydrates and refined sugars had a more higher chance of having actually having h pylori and basically they were consuming much poorer quality food and the reason why it was done in brazil was because brazil has some of the highest rates of h pylori in the world being a, being classed technically as a third world country due to the poverty poverty over there and so what that so that is actually could be a reason what happens is that ammonium actually alkalizes the stomach acid but that alkalization what it does is it uses it as a way of protecting itself so the h pylori is using that ammonium like, like a shield because it protects itself from the actual stomach acid and just alkaline being the opposite of acidic so remember what i said earlier about the acid environment of the stomach being the main barrier between the outside and the inside world so just alkalizing is doing the opposite of that yeah yeah and so what's happening because that h pylori is alkalizing the stomach acid it's not a good thing that it's doing that but what it's doing is it that's what's protecting itself from the stomach acid but then to increase the acid it it makes sure that that the histamine is being released now in your stomach you have parietal cells and you'll probably hear about these parietal cells these parietal cells are what produce acid but they also produced the antiacid which is not an antiacid but it's bicarbonate so bicarbonate is what was used to get rid of the acid in the stomach now because that histamine your body produces histamine in order to trigger the parietal cells to produce the acid and what will happen is 
because the, the, the H. pylori is utilizing that histamine, it's increasing that acid content, but also using the, the urea to create that ammonia, and it's using a protective shield. And what happens is that, that as increasing acid, the ammonium, that balance of it, it creates the perfect environment for the flagella to swim and then enter the um, epithelial cells. And above the epithelial cells, the epithelial cells actually produce a mucus. And that wow. mucus layer protects the stomach lining. It protects it from the actual H. pylori to actually going through. But because there's like an increase in acidity and because the H. pylori produces lipopolysaccharides, what it does is it starts to thin that mucus layer. And as it thins, the LPS attaches itself to the actual physical stomach lining. And then this is where it gets really, really messed up. So H. pylori produces, produces exotoxins, so CAG-A and VAC-A. CAG-A basically disrupts the cell wall integrity. So you know the, they talk about the leaky gut? Technically, I think, and I'm going to say this first because I've not heard this before, it creates a leaky stomach. Because what it does is CAG-A actually destroys that in, in between of it. And then VAC-A causes cellular death so it actually creates the like the apoptosis process and it allows the cells to start to die and so as those those cells start to die what happens is that mucus and stomach acid mix together breaking through into that that the epithelial cells and then that's what triggers a stomach ulcer and h pylori is literally attached to those epithelial cells and that's what allows that basically at the H. pylori to kind of go through and cause all that havoc. Mm -hmm. How awesome is that? That a bacteria is that smart to be able to do that? That it not only creates the environment where it can actually be killed, but also protect itself from the actual physical environment. That's genius, isn't it? The reason why I said it was interesting was because the way that H. pylori, H. pylori is one of those bacteria is that it can survive really harsh acidic conditions. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a lot of bacteria, because of the way that they're processed, they can't actually survive those acidic conditions. And so we still don't understand why H. pylori is there. There actually is a really interesting bit of research coming out of Oxford University where they're trying to use H. pylori as a drug delivery mechanism. Oh, really? To, the, to, to treat stomach cancer, they're trying to put the actual um, drugs into the H. pylori and then for it to use its post natural processes to deliver the drugs into the stomach lining. That's so interesting. Yeah, so which is Although cool. assumably they would have to come, like, I assume they're studying the natural mechanisms of the H. pylori bacteria because in order to utilize it as a pharmaceutical, they'd have to create a synthetic version because they have to be in control of every step of that mechanism because you can't legally use something that's yeah. natural as a pharmaceutical. I just read. My understanding. I just read the, I read the bit of information on their website that I was going through. I'll I'll link it. I just find it interesting that we're trying to do that. I feel like sometimes that like people, like the university professors, just like you know what? I wonder if we can do this and just to see what happens. No, but I, I mean, I think that's how we create a lot of things in this world. Like nature is the most wise teacher out there mm. like so many of the things that we've created um or even the things that we say oh science has discovered this you look back and it's intrinsic to nature yeah you know just to go back to what you were saying there about the intrinsic nature so the the most important things to take about what i just said about h pylori is the histamine and the ammonium they're the two most important things that we need to focus on today what's funny is when I started doing the research into it a bit more, we were looking at the causes of H. pylori. Mm. The funniest connection I found was the fact that it's the most likely passage is from mum to child. Okay. And so you have it from as a young from a young child. So a child would have it as a carrier from a young age. And then as they get older, that's what they can't work out. Do you mean that because obviously H. pylori is quite contagious. So you're talking about if mother, do you mean in utero or because it's quite mm. common in children. Mm. But are you talking about in utero? Sorry, I meant in children. Oh, in children. That's what I meant, yeah. So, so essentially like, it, yeah. so it wouldn't necessarily be from the mom. It could just be any adult in the household. Well, according to the study that I was reading, mm. it was more down to the mother having it and then passing it to the child. Why would that be, though? Because the, the mother's a carrier. 
No, but why would it be the mother over any other adult carrier in the household? I, I, you, that's really interesting. I didn't think of that. Like, to ask that. So the other parent, they could have it. They can infect the mum. And if the if the mum's spending a lot of the time with the child, if they've not washed their hands after doing certain things because they're busy, as you are well versed in, it could be that they pass it to the child. I think my guess would be that the statistics show mum because statistically mums still tend to do the majority of the child rearing. Mm. Mm. I might get in trouble for saying that, but I'm pretty sure statistically um, that is still the case. Um, and if it's so, not, they can they try to statistically prove you prove you wrong. Well, I think, <laughs> or at least when they did the study, like that, that's the only thing that would make sense because yeah. it wouldn't make sense that it would be specifically mum um, over, you know, the other parent or any other adult living in the household Um because it's not gender uh, specific in terms of the bacteria. Sorry, mm. I was just interested in that because I know in, I know, uh, they say that a lot is a lot of children tend to get H. pylori and then it can live dormant for many many years and, um, you know, really when you look up what are the causes of H. pylori, the first line is always, we don't know what causes H. pylori. Mm. But actually, if you look into the background of it, there's, um, you know, there's a, a couple of different causes that I think could make sense and a, a couple of strong theories. Um but we probably don't want to look into those. No, well, we do, because that's <laughs> hence why I mentioned the, the Brazil study, because the Brazil study was fascinating. The fact that they mm. were talking about that, if it lies dormant, could your diet play a role in H. pylori actually becoming mm. virulent? And I think th diet is definitely um, a strong contender in terms of the, the spreading of it, particularly our current diet, uh. both through the use of antibiotics in our agricultural system causing antibiotic uh, resistance or um, causing the presence of that bacteria to be higher in our livestock, plus then the side of the diet, which is us consuming a highly processed diet, which can affect our stomach acid levels and infect and affect our uh, the integrity of stage two digestion. Mm. Um, I definitely think that could be a strong contender, plus the fact that it is such a contagious bacteria, so it's going to be easily spread. And if you don't have... Um, Good stomach acid. Yeah, if you don't have a, a, a stage two digestion of integrity, then you know, you're going to be more prone to harboring something like that. Yeah, especially if the one of the most prescribed medications in the entire UK is PPIs. Uh, UK, <laughs> more like bloody worldwide. So, well, the, you you say that, but you know what the funny thing was when the with the with the, um, the spread of the bacteria mm. was from fecal matter transfer, like from mm. people like literally pooping and not washing their hands. I was like, when I was reading that, I, I, people are nasty, man. There are some people out there just nasty that do not wash their hands after certain things, and they literally infect. A surface area and it can actually get onto food yeah i was like when you when you kind of read that it's just like that's nasty that is actually nasty i don't know if it bothers me as much as it bothers you oh, really? like i'm not like it's not nice <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm not saying like it's a nice thing not to wash your hands but i don't know i don't get i've never been that person that gets like super grossed out by that kind of a thing. I'm just like, if your immune system's strong enough, you'll probably be fine. So you're okay things. with me if I went for a poop? No. And then do wash my hands? Like, I'm obviously not okay. <laughs> what are you saying here, T? What I'm, are you saying here, T? I'm not okay with that. And I definitely believe in washing your hands when appropriate. Mm. But I just kind of feel like it's not, you know, some people like really get het up on like, oh, someone isn't washing their hands. Or so, like, you know, anti-backing everything. Mm. I'm just saying I'm not that person. Oh, I get that. But I'm that. not pro-poo hands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. I'm gonna... <laughs> People are like, what is what we're talking about? <sighs> like, I get that. Like, anti-backing the crap out of everything. Because that then leads on to... It leads to, okay, we've got to talk about food first. Yeah. Because I have to talk to... I like... T, I've been dying to talk to you about this because it made me laugh so much. Uh, when I was putting together like my my like points, I was doing some like reading about the H. pylori diet, and oh my god, 
if you if you're talking about diet with h pylori just do me a favor before you talk about it read about h pylori and what the mechanism of action is because i was really like oh, can i say that can i say the word functional diet dietitians can i say that i'm allowed to say is it? it a dirty word i didn't no, realize like, it was it's just like because <laughs> obviously not all of them probably do this but i'm just gonna say it was from a functional dietitian that said this right and it was a couple that came around because i started doing a bit of googling into it and doing a bit of research around it i'm genuinely trying to figure out and or anticipate whether what you're going to say is going to be like positive or negative because i literally have no idea and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> so Basically, they were talking about things that you can do with your diet, right? Because that's a dietitian's role. Is talking about the diet and food and stuff. Really? Yes. Yeah, I know that. But dietitian. Sarcastic. Sorry. Gear. But basically, <laughs> they were saying about like, oh, when you have meat and you cook meat, you should cook it so it's really soft and then easily digestible. I was like, are you actually taking the piss? Because do you know what a byproduct of protein actually is? T, what's a byproduct of protein? Ammonia. And what does H. pylori create in the in the stomach? Ammonia. So are Do you are you are, are you actually taking a piss? Like, how can you recommend something like an ammonia based like you know protein in the physical diet when it's a byproduct? You're literally going to feed the stomach bacteria. Yes, it's if it's softer, it makes it easily more chewable for the person. But you're literally going to be feeding the stomach bacteria ammonia. I'm surprised that that's coming from a functionally trained practitioner as opposed because I I would understand in the allopathic um, approach in terms mm. of you're trying to support the symptomology. So obviously, if the um, integrity of your stomach is compromised, then mm. giving softer, more easily digestible foods makes sense in that way of thinking. Um, but I'm surprised that it would be coming from like a root cause practitioner. Um, yeah, trust but... me, I was as shocked as you were when I when I saw it. Mm. I just it it was one in particular video that made me laugh about it, and that's why I kind of like I saw it and I was like, oh god. And if there are any functional dietitians watching this. And, you know, if you're offended by what I've said, it was just something that I saw and I just had to talk about it. Cut, leave a comment. Come back at it. <laughs> Dilly loves here. to call people out. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, before you even, if you're going to recommend it like this sort of dieting with H. pylori, don't do it. Because you're literally feeding the ammonia that the bacteria needs. And this is the whole point of what the bacteria is using as a layer of protection. But I assume what they're trying to say is that by increasing that ammonia, you're reducing the stomach acid. Now, I don't know if people realise this, that's not a good thing either. Because mm. you do not want to reduce the stomach acid. This is a thing that doesn't make sense to me either. And I recognise we're going totally off point. No, go, but let's, just let's with talk about the, this. With the idea that if you're, um, and I'm not a H. pylori diet specialist or anything like that, so I'm just literally um, kind of thinking about this on the spot, but um, the fact that the recommendation would be to cook your meat, you know, well and make it softer and more digestible, as opposed to kind of reducing meat consumption and being careful with the level of protein for you know the the treatment time is confusing to me because one the ammonia aspect but also the fact that your stomach acid is likely to be compromised in a situation like that and you require stomach acid to break down protein efficiently in particular as a put in comparison to other macronutrients like it would make more sense to me that while you're treating this issue that you would probably reduce kind of your really heavy proteins obviously you don't want to you know reduce protein completely because we need that for building blocks but I would probably switch to more gentle protein sources um so yeah that's just surprising to me in and of itself but um yeah 
And that's the thing, that's the problem with ammonia. If you increase ammonia, the only way to get it to convert back into urea is to use bicarbonate, mm. hence the link between acid reflux and high protein diets, mm -hmm. and hence the link between H. pylori and protein. So it's like, it diet does play a role, but like you just said there, there's more to it that meets the eye. So I think, I don't know why they've got this isolated focus. I think the reason why is because they talk about broccoli, and like for those types of foods, because it is it, I'm going to say it's incorrectly, sulforaphane. Sulforaphane. There you go, sulforaphane. I can never get my English right for these things. But that basically inhibits that urea mm -hmm. from turning into ammonia. That's what it does. It's, it's an inhibition for Just it. Just for context. So, because um, another thing that's often recommended under the H. pylori diet is consumption of broccoli that's yeah. what you're saying there and that's all that's all it's doing it's not treating the h pylori in any way when it's not doing anything more to the h pylori it's mm. just stopping that conversion well it's quite interesting to me because i think like a lot of the recommendations they're kind of throwing this list of seemingly random foods at you because of the like these isolated studies that have been done to show that, you know, oh, the sulfurophane can do this or like this can do that, um, as opposed to kind of looking a little bit more holistically at the issue and thinking, OK, we have a we have a compromised stomach here. Um, how can we continue to nourish the body as a whole, um, but attack this bacteria and get the stomach working again properly, mm. as opposed to like, let's just throw all these random foods. You know, I think there could be an argument just for, you know, softening the diet for a little bit and, you know, including gentle, nourishing, antioxidant rich foods, as opposed to kind of going highly specialist. Um, I mean, the antioxidant-rich foods actually comes quite a lot in the dietitians lists. Uh, lists. Okay. But what they talk about is not increase, increasing the HCL. So mm. not if you don't increase the acid, because obviously if the person's got they the don't talk about increasing the there acid. because they talk about like not using things like bitters, for example, um, or like certain supplements that increase Why? HCL. Because you, when the H, if the hypochlorite it's got it's attached to the 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 um, yeah. the the stomach lining, yeah, yeah. what would happen is if they increase the acid, it could make that, exacerbate that the, the, the issue. The symptoms, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting, but then you need an increase in the stomach acid in order to destroy the bacteria as well. No, that's what I'm saying, because yeah. the, like, one of the common therapies is, um, like, triple therapy, so your antibiotics and your PPIs to reduce the stomach acid, and this whole idea of reduce the stomach acid because the increased stomach acid could... Um, cause a little bit more discomfort because of the symptoms but you need to increase the stomach acid to eradicate the bacteria and to support digestion so you're kind of like delaying proper recovery anyway yeah do so you see what I mean do you see what I mean how controversially weird it actually is yeah it's such an interesting topic so like you're it, with that approach, your only hope is that by you basically wipe everything with the antibiotics, but then you should be immediately coming off any sort of PPI and increasing everything to support increased stomach acid to try and then maintain the integrity again. Although most likely that possibly isn't what's happening but also it doesn't really get across the issue anyway because if you take a course of antibiotics you're if you did have a vulnerability there so say you had it had developed into ulceration of the stomach and so you're keeping the stomach acid low to avoid the discomfort that's not going to be resolved in the same amount of time that you would take a course of antibiotics, because you're only going to be taking a course of antibiotics for a Seven couple of weeks or 14 max, days, yeah. you know. So that's not going to resolve itself anyway. So it makes no sense. Sorry, I'm totally... <laughs> you're not. I, I'm really just you're... working through this from, you know, in terms of understanding how the body works. I'm just working through this as you're saying it to me. And I'm like... 
they, they, there's no way that works. Yeah. And then that's the issue because then what you do is you end up being on long-term PPIs because of the stomach ulcers. Because yeah. like, oh, we don't want the acid to be high. So we'll put the person on long-term PPIs. But by trying to avoid short-term discomfort, you're actually likely contributing to even greater discomfort long-term. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Tracy, welcome to allopathic medicine. <laughs> no, it's not even allopathic medicine. It's like it's it's like how we all love to approach life nowadays. Yeah. We're looking for the easiest sol- solution right now or the, like, least uncomfortable solution right now, even if it causes us years or decades of extreme discomfort. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And that, that's the issue. Yeah. It's and I'm talking about like common cases here. Obviously, there's going to be outliers where there's significant um, damage to the stomach that requires a different approach. I'm just talking in kind of general terms here. But that's that's really interesting. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. It, it, like I said, it made, it made me laugh. And you brought up triple therapy now. So let's talk about antibiotics. <laughs> because... Fuck. When I started going on this be careful. topic... I went down a rabbit hole and and if anyone knows me or anyone too well, people that do know me, I love a rabbit hole. I love just <laughs> rabbit hole because I feel like sometimes because we have everything's like, you know, compartmentalization, even science is compartmentalized and basically they put different sections, different sections. And I started looking at the triple therapy and understanding it a bit more because mm-hmm. clomithromycin is like the main drug that's used in it, right? I hope I said that correctly and if I didn't... Um, Sorry. That's just Dilly. That's me. <laughs> um, these are known as the macrolide drugs. Mm-hmm. They're, called the, they're called the myosin because it's, it sits in like a family of those types of antibiotics. And what I started reading about was antibiotic resistance mm-hmm. because H. pylori is on the top 20 list of the WHO guidance for antibiotic resistant bacteria or ARB. And I wanted to find out why we were becoming antibiotic resistant. So I thought I need to cover this a little bit more in this. Now, Honestly, I'm not going to cover this entirety. I think this is going to become a separate video because this is going to be like tea. I think we're going to have to do a whole covering of this because it's going to look at like how much antibiotics are actually being put into animals. And what I understood was when you go to your GP and they they say, right, you've got H. pylori, you're showing the symptoms, we need to treat it. The question they have to ask you is, have you taken any type of the macrolides, like medications? And if you have, like, because they use those type of medications for, like, um, people with asthma. So looking at, like, sorry, asthma, sorry, with infections in the lungs, people with skin infections, they'll use those type of medications, right? And what's interesting is if you say yes, then they have to go to quadruple therapy. They normally should miss the triple therapy mm. because it's likely that your your body, it won't Be react to it, right? Yeah. And but what made me laugh right was when you start looking at the macrolide medica- like the actual medications, and then you apply it to agriculture and how much we use it in farming. Tea, girl, it's disgusting. Like it's yeah. actually disgusting. So I'm not going to cover this topic deeply because I think it needs to be a separate video. But what the interesting thing what they found was that a lot of the meat contained over 10 different types of antibiotics. And that a lot of the antibiotics were above the recommended like a daily amount a human could actually consume. So what they're finding now is that a lot of the meat is containing the antibiotics like it already in them because we're using it in agriculture because we're so aggressively now rearing animals. And... I'm going to link the paper. This isn't a late study. This was published in March 2024. Mm. And so read it and we're going to do a separate video about it and cover it. So this is another reason why we've been looking now at quadruple therapy, which is the additional of bismuth. Mm-hmm. And it's another... Because more t- is more, right? Because more is more. And did you know if triple therapy doesn't work, you know what their solution was? So right. back in the day when triple therapy was first discovered, it used to be for seven days. And the uh, the... The solution to triple therapy not functioning was to increase it to 14 days. So just... just More is more. More is more, right? Mm -hmm. So just think about that. Right. I've covered that topic. And so I want to move on to treatment. Mm. I want to talk about natural treatments. Yeah. Because natural treatments for me are just fascinating. Um, You know, right at the start, I said, let's talk about histamine and ammonium. So... 
there are two things that you need to look at. There are certain bacteria which bind to the bacteria in the stomach. In particular, one's called Lactobacillus ruteri, mm-hmm. DSM17648. So with our ruteri, mm-hmm. it's like a family name. You have different strains of our ruteri, but DSM17648 was the one that's been isolated. It's also been patented for H. pylori. Yeah. And what DSM17648 does, it basically has this degen molecules and it emits a protein which attaches to the H. pylori. And what they found was that it crowded the H. pylori bacteria and it basically pulled it out of the stomach and into the stool, mm. which is really interesting. So there are actually specific bacteria which target H. pylori. Um, I won't mention the actual product name, but mm-hmm. if you Google our root ride DSM17648, you'll find the yeah, product. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's commonly available. Yeah. And the second is zeolite clumped low light. Mm-hmm. There is a specific protocol, it's five days, which works on binding to the histamine and the ammonium. If you remove the ammonium shield, the stomach acid can destroy the bacteria. And if you bind to the histamine, you also balance the stomach acid. Mm-hmm. But what we don't talk about and where we need to move on to is the link between histamine and h pylori you literally read my mind i was was literally just going to say i was like oh have we explained have we spoken about the histamine h pylori link enough to kind of then move on to the zeolite tie so Go back to the stomach and just explain a little bit that, you know, you already brought it up when you spoke about the mechanism, but I think just hone in a little bit more around the histamine H. pylori link, because something that can also sometimes be recommended for people with H. pylori are histamine blockers. Yeah. Um, So can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. So as, as we were saying before, because H. pylori like emits LPS or lipopolysaccharides, those LPS attach to the um, epithelial cells. And then what it does, you have mast cells which surround the entire epithelial cells and the LPS trigger the mast cells to release that histamine. That histamine creates inflammation. So the reason why the mast cells actually surround the intestinal lining is actually a protective mechanism. Histamine creates inflammation. It doesn't, and that's what protects the leakiness. Mm. So, but it also stimulates stomach acid as like yeah. the baseline mechanism of uh, your stomach before yeah. kind of there's a disease or bacterial issue. And like you said, increasing the stomach acid to stop the, ba- the bacteria from thriving, the bad mm. or the bad bacteria what's causing the issue. So histamine is then circling around the system and causes other symptoms. And so this is where the problem lies, because there is a very strong link between histamine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this word because I have to use it. Intolerance. And if you watch our videos, it's not intolerance. You can't be intolerant to histamine. It's a histamine overload. So it triggers. You really pulled my joke there because I was like, oh, it's intolerance. I thought it was overload. <laughs> so it triggers histamine overload because what happens is that histamine is being released. And then that's what triggers more inflammation in the body. But then also the specific histamine receptors. Would you mind if I just quickly talk about leaky gut? Because yeah. I just want to talk about this. Just to anyone who's watching, you know this terminology where you'll probably read about leaky gut. So just to kind of clarify, it's the same with this idea of leaky stomach. What happens is they talk about like the epithelial cells with that cage and vacay destroying it, that the cell walls start to go further and further apart. And you've got to remember the protective mechanism here is the mast cells. They release histamine, which creates inflammation. If your gut was leaking, it was open, you'd be dead. Because blood would literally flow into your stomach, yeah. you would die. So stop. It's when when people think leaky gut, they just think their intestinal lining is just like this, and it's completely snapped, and everything's going through. It, it that's 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 impossible. We're talking about micro, micro, micro levels. Yeah, micro levels. Yeah. And so so please understand when we when we talk about us as when we talk about leaky gut, what we talk about is the histamine creating inflammation, which is creating the symptoms. So this is why a histamine binder is so so important because if you can reduce the histamine, you can reduce the inflammation, and you can allow the epithelial cells to repair which actually reduces the mast cells from being over-triggered. Mm. How easy is that? That's yeah. freaking simple. And it's also, I think, kind of to go a little bit deeper, it's not just about reducing the histamine to 
reduce the inflammation because less histamine means less inflammation. Mm. But it's also changing the messaging that your body is getting. So by binding to that excess histamine and removing it from the body, it's then signaling to your body that actually there isn't as big an issue here as we previously thought when all the infl- all the histamine was being released. Actually, we can calm down and we can go more into the repair and heal mode. So it's just as much about clearing the excess as it is about reprogramming the messaging that your body is getting. Um, so, yeah. T, I could not have said it any better myself. That literally is basically it, reprogramming the body. And so... Just to emphasize, if we are looking and addressing H. pylori, great, we understand the symptoms, great, we understand the causes, but that treatment is where we need to be focusing more our attention on. And I think the antibiotic resistance side of it is just it's scary. That's actually quite quite scary yeah. because we're finding it now in a lot of foods. And in the food chain, you've got to remember we're part of that food chain, especially omnivores. Yeah. Because... What then, or carnivores. Yeah, or carnivores, sorry. But what I'm saying, not just... Uh, what, Humans aren't just omnivore anymore, Dilly. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, that's very true. But what I was laughing at is because what I found funny was that the the funny thing was that people who were going on just plants, mm-hmm. what they were talking about was the fact that these animals, obviously when they poop, yeah, yeah. the poop goes into the ground, the, gra- the rainwater hits the ground, it then seeps through into the vegetables mm. and it travels through. So it's not just coming out of the meat anymore. But this is what I was going to say. And remember when I um, was talking to you a little bit about, I don't know how we got into it, but, you know, about whether, um, oh yeah, the rationale for being plant-based in this day and age and how my mindset on it had changed a little bit. And this was like a big factor was the fact that, you know, it's not just the meat industry that is, I don't want to say corrupt anymore, but that has been corrupted in a sense anymore, contaminated anymore. It's your vegetables as well. But we don't, I don't know, is there what kind of research there is on that specifically related to H. pylori, Um, but antibiotics contamination in all of your food is is a real big concern. Because I think, you know, when, when you, I think a lot of people are, aware to an extent of antibiotic resistance but I feel like it's still in the general mind comes down to the fact of well do you take a lot of antibiotics because you know there's definitely an over prescription issue in terms of you know you go in for anything Mm. and the answer seems to be antibiotics Um, but I'm not sure there's maybe as much of an awareness about the other sources of antibiotics, you know, through our food and water system, for example, being a big one, or even, you know, skincare, things like that. There's definitely antibiotic skincare. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. But I don't want to go off on a, yeah, on I a said, whole we thing. Need to, but... I think we need to cover this topic individually because okay. it's such a scary thing. Yeah. Just to give you a, give you a bit of facts, because, you know, I, I love my facts. Um, that paper, that 2024 paper that I've, I'm we've literally linked to the description, it showed that they attributed over 700,000 deaths in the UK to antibiotic resistant mm. bacteria. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's scary. Yeah. The fact that that's now become a major, major issue is, is a very, it's a, it's a problem. And so this is why like I've highlighted the alternative ways, just so you know, I know there are other alternatives. I know there's mastic gum. I know there's ni- like like black nigella seeds. I know there's other things that people talk about. I didn't cover them just yeah. because like I think a lot of people do cover those areas. But what I wanted to highlight was the fact that those those areas they look more so at like antioxidants or they look at like inhibiting like they have an antimicrobial function yeah, so they're working yeah, similar yeah, to that yeah, area. Yeah. But what I wanted to focus on was that histamine and ammonium because to me. When, when we talk to a lot of clinicians, and you know, we both do, mm. that when we talk about the histamine ammonium, it's like a eureka moment. They're like, ah, there's the missing link. Yeah. So histamine and ammonium, that's the main focus of this, this, this mm-hmm. topic today. I really hope everyone's enjoyed this conversation because I've really loved researching it. H. pylori is a big, big topic about that, you know, that I've personally 
done a lot of work in, mm. and I'm sure T has done herself. But what I'd say to people, if there is a specific area you want us to cover about H. pylori, because I think this is just the starter video. It's like a flavor video, I'd say, because we've covered a lot of different topics. Please yeah, I mean, I think for me, you've really pointed out the two big considerations when there's an active issue with H. pylori, you know, when you're at least kind of medium level along the... Um, What's, what's, I, I was going to say timeline, but mm. like along the course of where you can be with H. pylori, because as you said, you can have H. pylori and it can be asymptomatic or you can have uh, H. pylori and it can be wreaking absolute mayhem in your body. I would say if you're anywhere from a medium plus level, then what you mentioned about histamine and ammonium are to me, the two biggest factors, because as you mentioned, there are a lot of other foods and and protocols and things. I would look at that more in the kind of light to preventative area. Um, but if you have a really strong issue, then you really want to be looking more at those kind of the ammonium, the histamine and the antibiotic kind of medication level. So. Yeah. Yeah. And let's hope we let's hope we don't piss anyone off and get cancelled for this one because I think we wanted some deep topics here. But you need to stop putting that out in the universe. <laughs> you scare me. Every time you say anything, I'm like, oh Jesus, what's gonna come out of his mouth? Nah, I tease, man, I tease. Listen, but all we're doing is just sharing you know, information. Talking, um, sharing things that we've learned and even things that we're curious about and we're figuring out because we don't know everything. Yeah. Um, we're figuring this out as we go as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you, yeah, let us know your thoughts on this video because I think, uh, you know, let us know your opinions and what you think about H. pylori and what work you've done in it. And if anything that we've missed or anything you want to add, just let us know in the comments because like we're here to learn and here to share. This is a, as we said, it's a community of candid conversation where we get to, to speak our truths yeah and um if you've ever experienced h pylori let us know and let us know how that experience was what eventually worked for you or if you find that nothing's working and you're still struggling um let us know and we can have some more conversations or maybe this might be the missing link <laughs> thanks bye